Welcome to the greenpill.network podcast. In September, Green Pill will be hosted by the Cartographers, a high context community of individuals and teams dedicated to advancing the Web3 Grants ecosystem. They'll explore the Web3 Grants ecosystem with topics ranging from novel funding mechanisms, grant councils, and governance to emerging trends like AI and direct to contract incentives. This series seeks to bridge theory and practice by examining real world examples and featuring discussions with those who are closest to the action. The next voice you hear will be Sav, who contributes at Gitcoin and founded the Cartographers. Sav will be hosting this entire season. And I think that it's going to be a great season because Sav brings deep experience in Web3 grants and capital allocation. I'm excited for you to hear some of the perspectives from him and his guests. Without further ado, the next voice you'll hear is Sav. Enjoy. Hey, Coordination. Welcome to the next episode of the Green Pill Podcast. I am joined today by Jay, one of the founders of Royco, and excited to have him here. This episode focuses around intents and incentives. Um, as you've heard from me in previous episodes, we're starting to talk about you know, how ecosystems are looking at uh, taking incentives down to a lower layer, You know, getting away from more subjective human decision making. And I think that when you look at incent, intents, uh, and the way that incentives can map to that, there's some really interesting stuff that uh, could be coming down the pipeline. So we'll jump into some introductions and kind of go into the discussion. So Jay, I'll uh, turn the floor over to you to give a quick intro. Awesome. Well, first of all, thanks for, for having me. This is very exciting. I'm Jay. I'll give my quick like crypto origin story. Uh, I got into crypto back in 2016. At the time, I was working at a software, normal software company, and my boss told me, Hey, you should put all your money into Ethereum. And I thought I thought it was a scam. Um, a few weeks later, I read on Hacker News this post by Vitalik, and the ten percent I understood had me sold. So bought a bunch of ETH. It went up, and I was sold on going all in on ETH. Played all of the ICOs through twenty seventeen, and everybody wanted to participate in those. So built a mobile wallet and mobile app that made it super easy to fiat on ramp, get crypto assets like ETH. And then it had simple DEX integrations into places like Ether Delta, where you could go and buy all these altcoins. Because at the time, Coinbase had, what, three assets and Binance wasn't even live back then. This application was then acquired by MyCrypto in the following year. We were spending a lot of time just thinking about DeFi. And it was in the earliest of stages back when it was called Open Finance back then. Um, and spent a lot of time thinking about what would the future of Open Finance be Fast forward a couple of years, we had a ton of integrations of all these DeFi applications inside the mobile app into the MyCrypto stack. MyCrypto was then later acquired by MetaMask. But at the start of 2020, I was a senior in high school and I said, wow, we're going to have a lot of time on our hands because of this COVID thing. Let's go and do our own thing. So then at the start of 2020, with two of my really good friends, we started a company called Rari Capital started as a simple yield aggregator, and then pivoted to a lending and borrowing platform, where the most lending and borrowing platforms at the time, they, they said, hey, here's the 10 assets you can lend and borrow. And it was a centralized group of planners, their, their token holders relatively, who were deciding what assets you can borrow and lend against and setting all those rules. So we at the time said, hey, that's unfair. You should be able to borrow and lend everything, and the market should decide all those rates and all those parameters. And that's how Fuse was born. We grew Fuse to about $1.5 billion in TVL. Um, and then it was acquired by another DAO called the Tribe DAO, at which point I really stepped back, spent a lot of time thinking, okay, what do I want to do next? And about just under two years ago, started Waymont. In, in the wake of FTX falling um, and I, all, these, all these folks losing their money, we said, hey, let's go solve this problem of crypto custody, right? And let's go and help these crypto whales secure their assets in a more efficient, more safe manner where they don't need to be constantly stressing. And that's that's the company we set out to build two years ago. So today I'm still co-founder uh, and CEO of, of Waymont. And most recently what Waymont's been working on is basically contributing to, to the Royco protocol. And one, of, one of the really cool things about this Royco protocol is like, Yes, in that origin story, but there are so many different teams now working on the Royco protocol across a wide variety of different pieces of the stack. It's, it's really exciting. So yeah, that's, that's kind of a quick background. 
Nice. We came into the space at the same time. I have fond memories of my Mew wallet. And all those things. <laughs> so super cool to, to hear that. You know, I didn't fare well at ICOs, but uh, I learned a lot through that process. I guess we'll keep it at that. <laughs> um, so when we jump into the crux of the episode, you know, we really want to take a look at traditional Web3 incentive programs, which I think there's been a lot of progress made around incentives and grants over the last few years, but there's still a lot of work to be done. A big part of the opportunity that crypto really presents for us is the fact that we can have verifiable impact. We can have these things on chain. We can really start to look at, you know, how we can build systems on top of each other that better interoperate. And there's all kinds of interesting, you know, applications around reputation and things that can kind of feed into that process of just making grants and incentives more efficient. Some of the big challenges that I see faced by grant programs today are definitely that they just waste a lot of time. I think builders waste a lot of time too. And so if I'm a builder looking for the right program for me, that can be challenging. I have different experiences and um, ultimately I might not be able to put my skills to good use because I get caught up in the process and I don't really find a great place to apply myself. And so it's a big reason I wanted to have you on the show today. I'm super excited to kind of talk about how intense um, could feed into that. So maybe we'll jump into it around when you think about kind of like this concept of direct to contract incentives, right? For the audience, really what that's all about is How do you encode those incentives at like a smart contract layer and take human decision making out of the process that way? You know, Jay, when you think about kind of like Royco, and I know some of the previous conversations that we've had, you start to see like opportunities for grantee markets, like matchmaking markets, like things like that that could occur through, you know, Royco and, and, you know, these types of systems. Maybe walk us through like what your vision for that could be and we'll go into it from there. Yeah, totally. So maybe I can quickly explain how we got to Royco. And then from there, it will kind of become clear on what we're thinking for in terms of these grants. So how we got to Royco was basically we were seeing and participating in a lot of these off-chain liquidity deals, right? So historical context, 2020 was the most amazing time for DeFi and for crypto, right? There were yields flying everywhere. It was insane to be in crypto in 2020, right? And then what happened in this period of 2021 to 2024, where we are today, is these incentive programs, right? They were moved off chain. They were given to elite institutions, whales, et cetera, et cetera, who had access. Why did that happen? It was just purely because it was more efficient, right? They could go and collect all of this liquidity. They could say and have guarantees that they'd have $50 million in their network on day one. Right? Why would you go run a public program where you're launching a token, you're putting yourself at risk, you're doing all these things, when well, you could just go do it off chain. And with a few calls, you could instantly go and acquire 50, 100, even more million dollars uh, pre, pre-launch. pre right? um, This was a really interesting um, basically market force. It seemed like there was no way of, of basically turning back and putting it all back on chain unless we could develop a more efficient mechanism for doing this. And that's essentially what Royco is, right? So the basic idea behind Royco is can we develop the most efficient way to distribute incentives to do anything? So for example, let's say you're a liquidity farm, right? And you want to think about liquidity and you want to basically garner liquidity into your platform. You could go run an incentive campaign that says, hey, I'm distributing 200 tokens per day. And then maybe an LP could come along and say, hey, I'll deposit a billion dollars if you give 205 tokens per day, right? Or maybe you see, hey, look, I won't leave my liquidity or I won't withdraw until you hit 100 tokens per day, right? Now, here's the really cool thing about these decisions is now that the incentive provider can see, wow, if we increase our token spend by five tokens per day, we'll unlock a billion dollars more in liquidity. Or maybe they'll see, wow, we're spending 200 tokens per day But this guy is not going to leave until it hits 100 tokens per day. Why don't we just decrease it to 101, save 99 tokens per day, and that's going to have crazy impacts on our spending. The issue here is that most DAOs, most spending, most liquidity incentives, these teams aren't thinking about it because there's no systematic way to run these processes. Even if they go so far as to A-B test, right, and say, hey, let's try 200 tokens per day for this week. Let's try 400 tokens per day the next week. Let's see what effect that has on our liquidity. It doesn't work because the market conditions are constantly changing, 
right? So what you have today in terms of people quoting, people entering and leaving, isn't going to be true tomorrow. Hell, it might not be true in the next 10 minutes, right? So you need a system that's dynamic where people can express via intent, hey, look, I'm going to deposit a billion dollars if the rate is going to give me this. And this enables these incentive providers to have much more efficient spending. Now, at the root of all of this, what, what you'll notice is you have this theme of, hey, look, the incentive provider, the person who's actually paying, they're only paying when an outcome happens, right? They're only paying in this case when liquidity is brought into a pool. That's where we see grant making going, where you're incentivizing for a specific, as you said in the start of this call or in the start of this episode, verifiable outcome. Right. Instead of going in and incentivizing, hey, let's give a hundred thousand dollars to this team to bootstrap themselves. Right. It's much more effective to take that one hundred thousand dollars, throw it into liquidity incentives that will help them grow their platform, and they can do so in the most efficient way. Right. Does this make sense so far? Absolutely. Yeah, and I can definitely see where you know today a lot of grant programs, like when they're first getting started. A lot of their work is, you know, there's a lot of L2s and a lot of treasuries being created from those. And how do we get basic infrastructure set up on our network, DEXs, oracles, et cetera. So we're funding those types of projects. But once that critical infrastructure is deployed and then once they really start to focus on how do I drive the right kind of impact, you know, for my protocol, if I'm DeFi focused or whatever it might be, then you start to see these incentive programs pop up that ultimately don't get at necessarily they're not they're not tied directly to those outcomes right they're i'm incentivizing builders and hopefully those builders contribute in some ways that it kind of um gives me these outcomes and really what you're talking about is you short circuit that a little bit where you can directly tie the incentives to the outcomes and then kind of monitor and manage to that over time exactly what we've been talking about is liquidity so far right that's just because it's easiest to understand liquidity in this concept but i think we're the whole protocol gets the most exciting. It's kind of when you leave this liquidity hemisphere, right? So there's two different types of markets inside of Royco. Um, and the one that's way more interesting <laughs> is called a recipe markets. And with a recipe market, we basically built this, you can think of it as a transaction builder, right? And with this transaction builder, you can incentivize and create a market for anything. So I can come into this transaction builder and say, hey, look, here's a transaction to go vote on this governance proposal. Or I could say, here's a transaction to go and go long on some coin. Or here's a transaction that will basically end in somebody going and giving a grant on Gitcoin, right? And then with this transaction built, I can go into the marketplace, right? And say, hey, I'll give you 200 tokens to do this. Now, somebody can say, wow, that's cool. I'll do it for 100 tokens. They, they aren't talking to each other, right? This is all happening via smart contracts. They're just placing these offers. Now, they'll do it for 100 tokens. Now, maybe the person who's providing those incentives says, yeah, 100 tokens is good. Now, they take that order, they fill it, they give 100 tokens, and the user's assets, whatever assets were committed, right, the transaction happens with them. So maybe it's, hey, for that 100 tokens, now they're going to go and execute a Gitcoin grant. Maybe they're going to go and vote on some governance proposal, whatever. And it's really cool because what you get here is an order book where you can see, hey, look, I can pay 100 tokens in exchange for 100 ETH on, on this Gitcoin grant. But maybe somebody else says, hey, I'll do it for 99 tokens for 100 ETH on this Gitcoin grant. And what you unlock in doing all of this on a publicly accessible order book that's publicly accessible by anybody who can connect to Ethereum is you get this amazing price discovery. Because it's happening on chain, you're going to get executed at likely the best price because you have this competition that's happening on chain. Yeah, no, I can totally see that, right? What are your thoughts when you think about like things like liquidity, like you pointed out, those are pretty like quantitative metrics, right? Like either TVL is going up or not, you know, daily active users, like some of these things, I don't want to say they can be gamed, but they are metrics that you can kind of like manage to, right? Or maybe like, like even bots, you know, could, could affect some of these. When you think about more qualitative things, right? So I'm a grantee and I could definitely see grantee markets, you know, occurring. I, someone, I place an order, you know, someone places an order for my services or the work that I do and I fulfill on that. How do you view that kind of 
you know, over time, the opportunities around reputation and kind of like proving that type of impact because you can facilitate the markets, but how do you make sure that they stay efficient? You know, totally, totally. So I would say generally Royco does not go in that direction at all. It's going to stay on the very quantitative things, the things that it can prove the execute transactions where the transactions are all already built on chain. There should be no room for question marks. The reason for this is just generally, that's how you build the most efficient system, right? And and when you kind of look at some of these more subjective grant programs and stuff, right, there are ways that you can distill most of them down to quantitative things, right? Maybe it's not easy, but we, yeah. we think that there are ways that you can distill them down to quantitative things that can then go and operate on Royco. And because it's quantitative, you get that extreme efficiency. Now, the second thing I'll say on this is, a lot of the times people kind of have a bad notion of incentives, right? Um, for, for the reasons that you described, hey, look, there's all these bots taking them. There's all of this taking them. Um, this is unfair uh, for, for whatever reason. And I would say generally the way, the way that we think about this is we are building for the most efficient state, right? And given that, the, the market will operate in the most efficient state possible, so I'll give a good example of this is you think about something like bondholders, right? And maybe in, in crypto, if you were to build a billion dollar deposit program with incentives and then people leave after the incentive program is gone, they'll say, wow, your users have no loyalty. That is wrong, right? Why did those users in reality leave is because it's the most rational profit seeking thing to go and do, Right. And this is something that's commonly understood in TradFi, right? Again, you're not paying out your bondholders. Your bondholders aren't sticking around with their assets in the bond after the bond has expired and after the coupon has come, right? Like that just doesn't make any sense. So I think that we're going to slowly and hopefully Royco will play a part in this is move to this like extreme rational and efficient market environment where we kind of rid ourselves of these notions of, hey, look, bots are bad and non-efficiency is bad. Yeah, no, I could totally see that. Maybe walk us through, you know, Royco's current implementation, right? Like you mentioned Ethereum. What does that implementation look like? And maybe if you think about that through the lens of like, I'm a grant manager, a program manager, someone that cares about incentives, you know, what in an ideal state for you, what does that experience look like for them? Totally. So Royco is probably going to be live in the next couple of weeks here. Um, In terms of what it what it's going to look like is it's going to live on Ethereum, it's going to live on Arbitrum, and then maybe a couple other chains soon after. In terms of, hey, what does it actually look like for somebody to come and build a grant program, for example, via Royco? There's so many different ways you could go and build it, depending, again, on that outcome that you're optimizing for, right? So let's walk through maybe a couple examples here. Let's say that I'm a Gitcoin, right? And I want to incentivize people to come in and basically participate in these Gitcoin grants, right? You could go and create markets for all of these Gitcoin grants. And you can basically operate these markets as a, as a rebate, right? You could say, hey, look, come in and participate in this market. You get some amount of Gitcoin back, right? And that can basically drive up market activity. We've seen how great rebates are in our, in the real world. Why not use a market efficient discovery mechanism where you could say, hey, look, if somebody deposits a million dollars into this market, they get a greater rebate than somebody who just deposits $100 into this market. And you can basically develop a, in like a depth chart fashion, it's just how I visualize it, a really great way to go and do rebates in a market efficient manner. So that's one way for like, if you wanted to throw it on top of Gitcoin, um, now let's talk about like, hey, look, I'm, I'm an Arbitrum foundation type figure. And, and what I really care about is basically making my sequencer money. How does my sequencer make money? Well, it's going to make money by basically trading and by these DeFi activities. Hey, I'm going to go and find which DeFi activity makes the most amount of money to, for my sequencer on chain. Maybe that's probably some sort of trading. Um, and then I'm going to go and throw incentives onto the Royco market that will incentivize people to come in and trade. Maybe because I'm optimizing for my sequencer revenues, I'm actually opti- <laughs> like I'm actually just paying out per transaction and I'm just adding a little bit of a rebate or something to basically drive up the volumes. There's going to be so many different ways that people use Royco and it really is going to come down to just like 
what exactly that that group is optimizing for. And so the way you describe it, I definitely feel like Royco is kind of that coordination layer. It's composable. You can kind of build. So, you know, I'm familiar with some of the transaction builders that have been out there before, and it sounds like it takes this to a whole nother level, right? Um, what are the pieces that you see kind of like feeding in to Royco? The reason I ask that is when I think about intents today, you know, the the common um, protocols and, pro- and teams that are building around that are mostly around kind of interoperability, bridging, et cetera, right? So does Royco become a coordination layer that then those systems tie into? Is that how you envision it? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. With V1, we took a pretty like, I don't want to say ignorant approach, but a pretty quick approach to like designing the protocol, albeit it took us six months plus to design the protocol in its current state. But we didn't think much about bridging cross-chain really intent infrastructure today. The only reason we used intents in the protocol as it exists today is because, well, it was the best way to build what we needed to build. In terms of the future and where where we want to take this, I think you're hitting it spot on, right? For the notes document of all of the things that we would like to see in like a V2 version of Royco. And a lot of this intent infrastructure, being able to do things cross-chain is going to be massively valuable for Royco. Right. Think about this today in Royco, you can say, hey, look, I'll deposit into this farm if it hits 30 percent. I'll deposit into this farm if it's 20 percent. Um, and while that's all happening, I'll sit inside of this pool earning 10 percent. Right. That's great and all, but it's confined to one chain or one layer or anything. We're going to work with a bunch of chain partners or, or rather bridge partners on making it so you can deposit from any chain into that. What we're missing is the ability to create orders across chains, right? Where you're on Ethereum earning whatever you are in your Athena pool. Um, But you can say, hey, look, if compound on Arbitrum hits this rate, yeah, I want to bridge and then move up there. That's so powerful. And like the downstream effects of that are going to be crazy. But just in terms of our infrastructure today, We're not there yet, but we're extremely excited about the work that all these other intent folks are working on because we think we'll end up working with one of them to go and help develop that V2. Totally. Yeah, it seems like that would be a lot of connective tissue that could really feed into this. In terms of the Royco experience, is this something that I as an end user am going to be interacting with and then I as a program would interact with? Or what does that experience look like? Like, is it going to help me as an end user discover these opportunities, right? In the same way it helps programs to provide them. Yeah, great question. So I guess you have a few different pieces here, right? You have the core Royco protocol, which we imagine incentive providers coming in and using, and we imagine some subset of users coming in and using, right? Then how are they going to access that protocol, right? They aren't going to go and interact with it on Etherscan realistically. I mean, some of them might. They're going to have a bunch of interfaces, So one of the really cool things that we're working on is getting a wide variety of interfaces basically up and running. You should be able to have Royco inside of every one of your wallets, inside of every one of your exchanges, showing you for every asset, hey, here are the applicable Royco markets where you can go and effectively deploy your liquidity um, or deploy your assets at, at this rate to do X, Y, and Z, right? In addition to that, the ecosystem is kind of working on spinning up a bunch of front ends for different purposes. Now, finally, these end users, right, despite being able to explore via your wallet, via whatever, just directly with the protocol, we do imagine there will be layers of abstraction built on top of Royco, right? It's it's gonna be a lot of work actively moving between different markets, doing this, setting limit orders, whatever. With a layer of abstraction, you could imagine basically automating all of that. So we're also um, basically, again, in the early stages of building this ecosystem, there are a few folks who are exploring building these layers of abstraction that sit at a level on on top of Royco. And then for, you know, the the Gitcoins of the world with Allo Protocol, I think about Open Zeppelin and kind of like their contracts library. Do you view those as things that could ultimately plug into this to provide those Lego blocks that you can then build the transactions with? Like, is that something you're actively looking at those partners? Exactly, exactly. So it's to kind of dive deeper into the transaction builder. You might be familiar and everybody in the Ethereum developer crowd is pretty familiar with like multi-call, right? Where you're able to Mm -hmm. call functions back to back to back on chain. Now, the big limitation of multi-call is how can you use the output of one transaction into the input of the next transaction? 
this is massively valuable for a lot of DeFi transactions, but also a lot of non-financial transactions to be able to use the output of one transaction to inform the input of the next transaction. So this was a big thing that we were blocked on for a while. Like, crap, how can we go and incentivize these markets if we can't use multi-call? And we discovered this uh, programming language. It's an entire functional scripting language developed by Nick Johnson and Dean Eigenman. And basically, they developed this functional scripting language so you can script transactions together really beautifully and really nicely, right? So we saw this, and it was a pretty primitive language, right? But it was exactly what we needed. So we built a ton of tooling around this. It's called Wayroll that basically makes it super easy to come in and build these. So you you mentioned you're familiar with transaction builders. If you think of something like a Gnosis transaction builder, that's pretty much what we've built, but it uses Wayroll, this language underneath the hood. So then it's not only that builder that you see in that first screen, but once you go and build that transaction, like in Gnosis, you have this next screen where you can configure the inputs and outputs of each parameter, and you can use the results of your prior transactions to inform the later one. So we think that this is going to be pretty huge in terms of what developers are able to leverage in terms of these building blocks that you mentioned, because they can pull in any contract, whether it's an open Zeppelin or whatever, developed by whoever, Gitcoin, for example, and they can just pull these in, type in that contract address, specify what functions they want to call, and they're off to the races. When you think about, you know, kind of like solving the longstanding issues that grant programs kind of see, you know, moving forward, it definitely sounds like creating these markets, both for builders and for the types of incentives that grants want to give out and the impact that they want to drive, right? Is that something that as Royco launches, I mean, you're, you're going to be addressing kind of day one or maybe walk us through, you know, if this thing's coming out here in the next few weeks, what are some of the early use cases that you're already working on and what might that look like at launch? Long story short, we're going to be working on a lot of different use cases because we want to see what happens essentially, right? So we're going to try basically doing one of everything has been our like internal memo on this, right? Of, hey, let's go try and do like one grants program. Let's go and try and do one of these. Let's go and try and do one of that, right? And to try and also spark the imagination of the community, right? It's, it's been a long time since the community has seen a new primitive, Right. And we want to go and get everybody excited about this and show them the full breadth of what can be done. Right. Because as I mentioned, with way roll and these recipes, you have so much power at anybody's fingertips. You don't even need to be a developer completely to go into write one of these markets. So we're we're pretty excited about that. And you can imagine a whole wide range of what can be done. So certainly all of the examples that we've discussed. Uh, another one that 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 we were just talking about the other day is Coinbase has doing has been doing a lot of advocacy, right? A lot of advocacy mm-hmm. work on on in, in in DC and such. They're running all of these events. Uh, at these events, they give out this NFT, right? Obviously, what does Coinbase want to do at the end of the day? They want more people to be at these events, right? Why do they want more people to be at the events? Hopefully, it turns out it comes to a better crypto vote at the end of the day. Now, what would happen? If you developed a Royco market, which anybody could incentivize to go and mint that Coinbase NFT. But the issue is you need to be at that event to go and mint that NFT. Now imagine a world where there is an incentive of $100 per NFT to go and mint that, right? Now what's going to happen is everybody near that event is going to want $100 just to show up to some event. Because it's been trustless, so you've aggregated the capital of all of these on-chain folks. Everybody's going to want to go to that event to claim their $100. They're going to go mint that NFT, and hopefully that will lead to a greater crypto. The reason I say this is just because of the flexibility of Royco, right? You've just taken minting an NFT, something so simple, into hopefully being able to change the outcomes of of elections. And we we think that like the possibilities are, are really exciting. Yeah, you know, hearing you talk, um, something that it reminds me of that isn't necessarily completely related, but it's Dune, right? When I think about Dune and the, the organic community that's been built around that and all sorts of people that are building their own views, you know, Dune dashboards, these types of things. It sounds like it's not that far of a stretch to kind of say that Royco could develop a similar type of community, but instead of it's these analytics views, it's these different ways that users have kind of put together these intense markets, right? Um, And that could even be something that 
could be proposed as a grant. Like if I'm a creative, you know, recipe builder, a chef, which I'm hoping that when you talk about <laughs> recipes, is that kind of like a, you yep. know, uh, a tribute to, you know, the the golden days of 2020 DeFi that you mentioned before, right? As that cook, as that chef, would I be able to create, you know, these different um, types of intense markets and then even propose those to protocols and grants programs in ways that, I'm creative. I can kind of like propose that up and it's not always on the program. It's like a community could foster that. Right. Yeah. Like to be honest, nothing would make me happier than seeing a future where that exactly occurs. Right. And you have like Mm -hmm. a full community of folks. Maybe they're even making full blown businesses, just helping other folks build their, I haven't said the word this entire time, but I am or incentivized action markets, right? Like to have a full-blown industry community, whatever we want to call it, helping construct these, that's so exciting. So I guess um, the last couple of questions I have is like, you mentioned earlier in this call that you're a contributor to Royco. So who are the contributors today? What does like building out the Royco protocol look like, you know, uh, today? Yeah. So Royco is entirely open source and it has been open source where anybody could come along and just make a contribution to it. And that's been like a really cool development cycle. I remember the other day I woke up and just found somebody had fixed one of the bugs that was in the code base. <laughs> and that's that's something you just don't get anywhere else. They weren't doing it because they were profit motivated. They weren't doing it for any one reason other than they were excited about the code base and they were excited about Royco. So when, when you ask me today, what, what does that process look like is there isn't a strict process. Right? It's a community of decentralized developers who are excited about what Royco is going to do. Maybe some of them have um, profit motivations. They work at a company that's going to be using Royco. They work at a company that's built just to help contribute to Royco. Whatever the case may be, it's been really amazing to just see all of these bright minds come together and contribute. So maybe last question, if I'm one of those potentially bright minds, how do I find out more information on Royco? Where can I go to, to dive in and learn more? Yeah, honestly, just go go to the GitHub and, and start exploring. You can check out the core protocol code base. Um, it's being audited as we speak, which has been a great process. And then the other thing is if you don't want to work on the core protocol work as that nears its end here, or depending on when this episode comes out, the protocol might be live, um, start playing with building recipes and trying to go and build amazing recipes. And then finally, there's going to be an entire ecosystem of applications that get built around Royco, whether it be those layers of abstraction that help uh, passive users basically allocate between markets in the most efficient manner. Whatever it is, we actually have an entire request for builders section inside of our GitHub that I'd suggest builders take a look at and see, see if anything sparks their interest. Awesome. Well, Jay, I really appreciate your time. This was an insightful episode. I think the audience is really going to dig it. Um, So yeah, you know, everyone check the show notes. You'll find some links there where you can find out more about Royco and uh, we're excited to see the launch. Thanks again. Awesome. Thanks for having me. 